Okay, should we, um, we're just going to make a start. We're just past 9, 9.20. Um, welcome everyone um, to this uh, Integrated Care Theatre. My name is uh, Dr. Shan Mantry. I am a former GP uh, and I'm now CCIO of Bain, Swindon and Wiltshire Integrated Care Board, as well as a independent digital healthcare consultant. Um, I'm involved in digital healthcare for perhaps over a decade. I started out being a GP board member of a CCG with a sort of interest in digital, and now I work full time as a digital healthcare professional. It's really great that we have a theatre here in Het on integrated care, because throughout my career, I think integration is so important in the way in which we deliver healthcare. I can recall when I first started to practice, it felt as though the system I worked in was just very fragmented. There were silos of information between mainly health and social care, but other organizations. And did it always make me feel that even within something like health, there were still silos. So that one hospital wouldn't talk to a community services, wouldn't talk to mental health. And as I worked as a GP, it felt as though I was the only one that seemed to know what, what was going on. And that was only partly. And I felt for my patients who were stuck in, in, in that system. However, I think things have really moved on since then. We're seeing a lot more integrated working, multidisciplinary working, people working across different sectors, and it's really fabulous to see. So I'm really hopeful that today's uh, talks will show you some of this really great practice and give you some ideas and inspiration to go back to your own organizations and your own areas of work. Um, one little um, uh, point in terms of my own ICS, we have a shared care record system that now crosses health and social care. So both those organizations share information into it and is able to see information from each other's organization. And we're about to go live with the third sector getting access to that information, which is a real, real bonus and a real plus. In terms of today, uh, just a few housekeeping points. I wanna say really thank you to our speakers, our uh, sponsors, and you, the delegates, for coming today to make this possible, as well as the great team at HET for putting on this, this conference. Um, we're using mics, as you've noticed, throughout the day, and we'll be doing Q&A. So I would, would stress that um, if you are asking a question, to use one of the roving mics just so we can all hear. Um, the final housekeeping point is when you leave the theatre at the end of the talk, um, to leave by the back exit so that um, they, people can be scanned in and out um, appropriately. Um, so we're just going to move on now to our first talk, which is a, a kind of a, a, a panel discussion and a reflection on integrated care. And I'm just going to head over to my lovely panel over here. Um, and so, oh, technical problems, let's grab that. Right, um, that's fine. So. I've been on many panels before and, and sometimes what happens is, is that we do the talking and then um, we do questions afterwards. So I thought we'd be slightly different today and we'll, we'll, we'll answer on a topic and then perhaps open up to questions in between. So we'll get a bit more sort of interactive in our, in our discussions. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be helpful for you and uh, we'll move things along. So um, I'm gonna ask each of my panel members here to introduce themselves and then perhaps give a, a kind of reflection on what they see is perhaps the biggest challenging facing integrated care systems in their, their point of view. So I'm gonna start at the end with Will. Do you wanna start? Good morning everyone, I'm Will Goodwin, I'm Assistant Director of Programmes for NHS England on digital capability and maturity. Um, so when I was reflecting on this, uh, for people who don't know, we ran the first digital maturity assessment last year uh, since 2016-17, which measured all of the ICSs as well as all NHS secondary care providers. Um, and one of the most interesting things about that was that the biggest takeaway I had from it was that it just it um, created conversations. So in a lot of cases, we were getting ICSs together who hadn't met with their provider organizations, with the CIOs in some cases, and bringing them together was a really, really interesting opportunity. And using the, the DMA as a, a driving tool behind that was, was really good. And I think 
looking at the scores that we got off year one where ICSs were slightly behind providers, I think they, the biggest challenge this year for me is going to be how do ICSs now take the data and understanding of where they are from a maturity point of view and then leverage the capabilities across the system to bring themselves up uh, along their digital maturity assessment scores for this year. So when we relaunch uh, in April this year, it's going to be really interesting to see what progress has been made in, in year one. And I think the, the I think sort of bringing themselves together as a collective and, and using the power of the ICS is going to be the, the big challenge for me and how they deliver on the strategies that they've been working on and how they make sure that the, the maturity stress assessment really drives that forwards. Um, because I think there's a lot to do and I think there's a, a lot of opportunity and it's going to be really interesting to see how they've all uh, taken that forwards. Brilliant. Thanks, Will. So, Kirsty. Uh, hi, I'm Kirsty Watson. I'm Digital Director for Northamptonshire ICB, responsible for ICS Digital. Uh, for me, the biggest challenge is, is around uh, having built ICBs. We're now seeking to reduce the size of them, uh, and that potentially means compacting really quite already lean teams uh, that may impact on our ability to de deliver transformation and benefits at scale. So that's really where I'm looking at, uh, at how do we get past that challenge to change the way that we do it. Brilliant. Tracy. Thank you. Morning everyone. Tracy Hopkins. I'm Chief Exec at Citizens Advice in Blackpool and I also represent the voluntary community faith and social enterprise sector on Lancashire and South Cumbria's ICB. So I'm a little bit different today because I'm coming from a slightly different angle working in the voluntary sector and the big challenge for me is as we kind of go forward with integrated health and care how do we harness what we have to offer in the voluntary sector and how do we make best use of all those community services and I think obviously about my own service citizens advice but also as many of you will know the voluntary sector has deep roots into communities and delivers so many essential services that make a difference to people's health and well-being but I don't feel at the moment that we've even started to scratch the surface around how we make sure those services are used within an integrated health and care system in the best way to deliver so that we're tackling health inequalities and to make sure that actually uh, people are getting the right care that they need at the right time in the right place. Brilliant, thanks Tracy and last but not least Masood. Morning. Um, so I'm Dr. Masood Ahmed. I'm currently a NED uh, at a mental health trust, but also an acute and a community trust. I'm uh, a trustee at a, a, a charity, so GOSH charity, um, and I'm an advisor to a number of startups. Um, for my sins, uh, I'm a clinician by background, but I've been very fortunate to have actually operated in, in various sort of settings to see how things have evolved. So I was chief medical officer of a CCG that became an ICB. I was then the chief digital information officer for um, an ICB and wrote their digital strategy. Um, and I've, I've also been in the commercial sector. So I was the global medical director for Dell where we specialized in kind of enterprise solutions. So um, I've, I've, I've had the benefit, if you like, or the opportunity to view a lot of what's going on through different lenses. So hopefully I'll be able to share some of my reflections in that respect. And um, well, I, I think we've got, we've got a good panel, if you like, that, that we can explore various avenues. Brilliant. Thank you, Masood. So I suppose at this point, I'd like to open it up to the, to the, the audience to, to say, has anyone got any particular questions around ICS challenges that you'd perhaps want us or the panel to, to discuss? Lady, right at the front. Hi, Masood. Hi, Masood. Nice to see you. Um, I think what we need to look at is not just ICS challenges, because the ICS is the umbrella term for all the providers. It's the ICB as well. So the lady, um, Christy? Christy. Um, the ICB, as we say, we're new. We're, we're being asked to... Um, take on a totally different challenging role from what was as a CCG and then also make sure that the ICS is compliant and I'm an information governance manager just so you know uh, making sure <laughs> that the ICS is a com the ICB is compliant and then the ICS as well so a lot of people still find that difficulty of understanding between an ICS and an ICB and that the ICS is the umbrella it's all of us together trying to work together to get the system sorted so that would be my comment at the moment, but it's difficult. 
I suppose, uh, uh, kind of reflecting on that, and it was one of the things we spoke about in our pre meet around um, the ICB and the ICSC is a very flat structure. And what you've mentioned, Kirsty, about the ICB, I work for an ICB, and I, I know in terms of the pressures of, of personnel and reducing the size, and how best to influence. Because in the past, you may have had a commissioner uh, sort of provider element, so there's a contractual lever. And I guess is how do we influence change in that flat structure with an organization such as the ICB that is much smaller? I don't know if, if the panel had any thoughts as to how we do that. Yeah, shall I? Masood? Shall I? Um, I think you're calling out the elephant in the room, really, aren't you? Um, the reality is we've got, we, we've moved from an old world where it was about competition. So all the providers were sovereign organizations, they still are, managing their budgets, being performance managed. The expectation is for them to deliver. And then suddenly we've got a new Health and Care Act where the expectation is that now suddenly you're all on the same team, but the structures that need to underpin that are not there. So my concern is that it's all very well in terms of the vision. And I believe in the vision that actually what's best for patients is for us to collaborate at a system level, including our voluntary uh, care sector partners, in order to improve care, improve access and improve outcomes for uh, our population. But, and this is a big but, where's the governance and where's the accountability? because we've had this new Health and Care Act come in, and the reality is when you speak to a lot of people um, within the ICBs, it, it's, it, you know, the analogy that's often used is we're building the plane as we're flying it. And the problem is that we don't have clarity. All the ICBs have gone through a process of developing their own governance structures and deciding what's best. And you know, yes, ICBs are new organizations, ICSs are collectives of established organizations. And there is a tension there that I think we're going to struggle with. So when you, when you look at nationally, which are the ICBs that are working in a more cohesive manner? It's the ones that actually have had that collaborative approach um, for a number of years. And unfortunately, I would say the majority of ICBs that are part of ICSs are struggling because we don't have that collaborative approach because each sovereign organization is still watching out for themselves. And I think we have to just be honest about it. That's the situation. And until we have clear governance and clear accountability, how are we going to collaborate? Because the reality is you can go to a number of ICS meetings and you'll get nodding heads. This is great. Yes, we should work together. But what does that mean in reality? And I don't think it translates. Kirsty? Uh, for me, I think, building on Masood's point, that actually it's the cultural change piece that I think we need to do differently. That the, what we had historically, that competitive culture, has radically got to change. But actually, the same people are in the same seats. So helping a, a team that historically were performance managers, as in with the big stick, now be improvement managers to work collaboratively to help people to do things differently uh, to improve the outcomes. It, it's a big cultural change and I'm not sure we've yet put in place all of the support and, and coaching and the right people necessarily in every role to, to try to move things forward. Um, and I think calling out IG is a good example. People often say, oh, they're an inhibitor, but actually they're not. They're a great enabler if you communicate with them right and, and make sure that everybody's got a legal duty to share, um, including across boundaries to third sector and voluntary sector organizations uh, for the best outcome for the patient. And as long as we keep the patient centric, we can make this change, but we've got to take a whole bunch of people with us. And I think that's going to be the interesting challenge this year. I, I suppose I reflect on 
the challenges of the health system about the reorganization because what you've just said Masood I heard the same when CCGs first came in in the sense of we're building the plane as we were doing it I was one of the clinicians who was brought in as part of the CCG and realizing we're not entirely sure what we are doing but we're working it out it feels like this is almost a cyclical thing that the health service likes to go through PCTs, CCGs, ICBs and I imagine in a decade there'll be some other acronym that we'll use but it is the nature of, of what we've got. I, I wanted to uh, touch on the point, Kirsty, that you made around uh, the third sector. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Tracy, we, 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 we had this conversation you know, b before this panel about the third sector and around how do we bring the third sector more into the discussion? We, we spoke about the ICS being a partnership and the third sector really need to be part of that. And I reflect on, on my previous clinical practice as to how much more the third sector are being commissioned to deliver now where things that were traditionally done by perhaps a community provider or maybe the GP is now being done by third sector providers. But it feels as though they are uh, potentially excluded sometimes from a lot of these discussions. And I don't know, Tracy, your reflections on, on, on your own area and how you're able to get a seat at the table. Yeah, thanks. I think it, sometimes the, the way in which we view the kind of reorganisation from kind of the outside looking in, um, maybe brings a little bit of a different kind of uh, perspective to things. It is really difficult from a voluntary sector to, to really kind of penetrate what's happening at the moment. Even though we are, we're told, equal partners around these tables, we're not equal partners. You can't be an equal partner when you've got a commissioning situation where, where your, your you know, uh, delivery of services is, is very much dependent on those relationships with commissioners, with uh, people across the, the ICB in particular. I think there's a, there's a lot of people who work in the voluntary sector who just get on and do what they're doing and aren't that interested in the reorganisation of health and care, if I'm completely honest with you. Um, but I think what we really need to do, and I can see this change and I can see these opportunities, certainly in Lancashire and South Cumbria, is that actually we, we are being brought into these conversations at the very beginning. So at the start of, of the planning process, as looking at how we are dealing with some of those really wicked issues that we're all grappling with at the moment around how we make sure people are discharged from hospital in a timely manner when they're medically fit to do so. How do we make sure people don't, don't turn up at ED when actually they should be somewhere else? And those are some of the solutions that the voluntary sector has the answers to as a partner in this system. And I think that's where we're really finding we're gaining traction because actually there's no way the NHS or the NHS and local authorities can solve some of these really big problems alone. And that acknowledgement, I think, has, has, has been there for a long time. But what I think the ICB in particular needs to do is enable and mobilise um, those things to happen. And also one of the things that, that seems very, very essential to me is where do place fit into this because actually place is where this difference is going to happen this is where the the icb if they get it right and enable things provide the right environment the right culture the right resources then actually we will see changes taking place at, at that place level and in those neighborhoods so i think we, we're on the kind of precipice of a real opportunity here but what we've not to do is let all of those barriers either real or perceived get in the way of us as a sector being able to actually deliver things in that integrated way. Yeah. Masood, you wanted to come um, in there. Yeah, j just listening to Tracy reminds me of um, when I was Chief Medical Officer of the Black Country. And the Black Country is the second most deprived system in, the, in, in England. We really struggled with vaccination. And actually, what we learnt was that as the NHS... We didn't have the answers. We didn't have the relationships with our communities. We didn't understand them. And yet, centrally, we were being told what to do. And I think that's partly the problem. There has to be a little bit of humility from us in the NHS to recognize that we, not only that we want to work with the voluntary sector, but we need to, because you are embedded within our communities. And when I think about the success that we had in the black country around the vaccination program, it was because we engaged with our community partners. We listened to the advice you were giving us and we got the sort of intelligence and insights that we wouldn't have got in any other way. 
And it was only by working with you as partners that we were able to, to, to drive forward with kind of improving our vaccination rates. And part of that was actually about the money. So um, as the CMO, I introduced this concept of participatory funding, where basically we made it really easy to give small amounts of money to community groups so they could just get on with doing what they needed to do rather than have every proposal need to be a business plan and have to go through all the, the kind of the, the check boxes. Um, because the reality was you knew best what to do. We didn't. And I think especially when you consider things like social prescribing, it's a similar situation. We have this huge asset that really we should be leveraging, but we can't do that until first of all, we recognize the assets there. And two, we work out how do we work with you in terms of getting the best out of, uh, if you like, the opportunity we have. I think um, just pushing back a bit around the third sector, I think one of the challenges for the system is that the, the element of the voluntary sector, there are a large number of organizations mm. and the large number of different routes and levels of maturity. I know that in my ICB role, there's a kind of a, a sense of uh, frustration is maybe too strong a word around uh, primary care and GPs because they're all independent businesses. And it can be a real struggle to get anything through because you've got to agree it with a whole load of uh, GP partners. But if you then look at the point of the, the voluntary sector, at least with the GP practice, they're all at a certain level. With the voluntary sector, it can be very variable. You have large organizations like yours, Tracy, that's a national organization. And then you've got a small two or three person charity. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how does the voluntary sector come together and perhaps work in a more unified way? Because we talk about the voluntary sector as one organization, but it isn't, it's, it's a collection. Yeah. So I don't know if there are any thoughts of the panel about how we organize that better, because you can't have a hundred voices around the table. Yes, absolutely. And, and you've hit the nail on the head for me, and I'm really glad you've asked this, because we are a really diverse and messy and unruly animal as a sector. And, uh, and in many ways, that's our strength. Uh, because, you know, being able to mobilise communities, being able to understand community need does necessitate you being there, being sprawling, being diverse. But I think there always has been that challenge, hasn't there? Because I think often NHS partners and local authority partners tend to go to the same people in the sector. And that can undermine some of the things that we're trying to achieve around making sure actually we're commissioning and working with the right organisations. So, you know, we've heard that as a sector. We've kind of said we, we realise this. And, and over the years, and I think with the, the, the kind of the, the long term plan, really kind of talking about how we organise ourselves as well. So, you know, in, in every area now, we should have an alliance that is that leadership of that that. Um, kind of sector voice now it isn't perfect so that's absolutely you know really important for me to say that because in my own area where I chair this alliance it definitely isn't perfect but what it's doing is it's bringing the sector together um, and recognizing that actually we, we need representation across all of the different groups forums areas that we can influence and what we're doing in Langston South Cumbria and, and it's happening in many other areas and there's some areas that are way ahead of us so I don't want to give the idea that we're kind of leading the way on this but what we're really doing is we're, we're saying we're here as a sector please engage with us there's a route now to engage with us and we will do what we can to ensure that the voice of the sector is there in those places that, that there is the, the that were needed really where decisions are being made around whether it's primary care whether it's around um workforce issues whether it's a, you know around quality and and we've started to mobilize that kind of network of leaders to, to sit on all of those different groups and forums and one of the things that that is so important is this isn't free so there is a cost element to us engaging with that and I think sometimes that that is the elephant in the room and that isn't always acknowledged. It, it's, it's an expensive thing for us to do as a sector. And I think once the, the recognition's there that actually uh, we're, we're a key system partner in the way that Sue explained in terms of you know being there when needed, then that, that really does kind of mobilize that resource. And that's where the change that we're starting to see is happening. Brilliant. 
Um, Will, uh, we spoke, you spoke at the start around the maturity assessments around NHS organisations. Is there any thought around NHS England looking at the third sector? Because there's obviously a degree where you're going to get some variability in maturity, both in terms of technology, but also for things like IG and data security protection toolkit and those types of things. Is that, is that anything on the, on the radar for NHS England? It is, and I suppose last year we did actually measure a lot of the community interest companies. So we worked with our community partners uh, to go out and actually assess some. The problem is, you, you hit the nail on the head, is there's such a diverse group. How do you measure it properly? How do you measure the right organisations, etc.? But I think from what we took this year, I've always found digital is almost like the stealth way in to having conversations about things because everyone needs digital to connect. And one of the things that I picked up on through a lot of our ICS sessions, and uh, reflecting back on it, actually listening to this, I think for this year we need to make sure we include more uh, of, of the third sector um, in those groups, was that how do they leverage the digital capabilities we have in the organisations who are commissioning the services to actually solve the problems that they're having with organisations like the charity sectors or the, the CICs and give them the tools that they need as part of that. So almost giving the having the conversations because they need to solve a problem with the digital side of things and it brings everyone together and I think that's what I've seen throughout the thing. It was talking about the ICSs and how do you, and ICBs and how do we, how do we sort of come together and again, it, for me it's been the digital conversations because the, it, it comes in as a, as a way to, we need to solve lots of different problems and digital will solve them whether it's sharing data etc and that seems to happen under the surface so organizations are coming together in the background almost and then it's starting to bubble up that actually everyone realizes they're all connected we can leverage workforce across across areas and i think for me that's going to be the key i think and i think this year we are actually expanding on the cic so last year we only measured a number of the larger ones because we didn't want to put maturity assessment on the <laughs> on a single uh, person for because it doesn't make sense but we're looking at how do we create that holistic view of maturity across system and do that interlinking for primary care for example we're moving into for next year we're looking at how do we include primary care within the ics surveys as well so we can see that holistic view because i think it's not just thinking about one part of the system, it's thinking about that whole pathway approach. And I think when you look at it from a pathway approach and how digital can enable each part of the pathway, it then creates the conversations between the people. Brilliant, thanks Will. I'm just opening up to, oh, we've got a question here. Oh, I'm doing the same. Hi. Thank you, I'm, I'm Daniel. Um, fantastic, fantastic panel bringing so much together. Um, just one thing to say to, Mas to Masood there, when you, you showed that one thing that IC ICBs don't yet do is the, how to really embed it is when the purse strings are taken from the same people who've been actually running them in the past and that's the next, the next generation that will really embed. And if the panel is talking about people rather than patients then we're talking about an ICS level thing which is very very important for me. I work in the social care sector and I'm very in, in concerned about the, the digital maturity because what it leads to, well you just said there, is how we create parity of esteem between people in the voluntary sector, in the social care sector, in the, and, and, and also <coughs> you said there about when you, you're bringing in the care record, you're bringing it into uh, uh, various different sectors and you mentioned the third sector. How's that working and who, does that who do you include in that third sector? So there's a lot in there, there's comments and questions as well, but amazing panel because I think this digital is the key to actually bringing that parity of esteem across different agents in the, set, in the, in the whole ICS uh, environment. So yeah, open up to panel, because I, I guess my reflection on that is, is, that is there a risk then that certain organisations are going to be ahead and then the other organisations who are still really valuable are, are going to be maybe left behind? Um, do you want to take that? It was interesting. We were actually having a conversation before this uh, around um, actually the key thing is to start and some of the connections and our lack of interoperability may be that data sharing may be more rudimentary. We may use different tools for different providers, but if we don't start, we'll never get on a journey. Um, and that's how we started. I worked for the police before I came into the health um, during the, the SOAM situation that radically changed the culture of sharing. Uh, and we went from organisations that hoarded data to organisations that had a, an approach of dare to share for the good of the citizen, the, the person. 
Um, and that's where we need to get to for the NHS. But that means starting initially, and some of the bits of sharing may be CSV files and really rudimentary, whilst other organisations can do full interoperability. But if we don't start somewhere, we won't start. So we're, we're all I, for I, it. Is there a danger though in terms of what the gentleman just said around language? Because I'm, I'm very mindful of using patient, citizen, person, yeah. because if I'm talking to health colleagues, if I say citizen, they just look at me as if, what the hell are you talking about? Have you gone crazy? If I go to my social care colleagues and said patient, I get the same view. So I do think that, I mean, what's your reflection there in language? Because we all use our own language within our own organizations. And the more we share, is there a danger that we're going to lose something in, in that? I mean, I, I, I take your point, Kirsty, we have to start, but it, what's the unintended consequence? I think that's really interesting about language because something that Will and I explored through what good looks like and, and changing one of the domain names that was originally uh, around centering the citizen um, and actually changing that to putting people at the heart of what good looks like is a, a radical change in approach. But that actually came from the social care and third sector input that said that, uh, that the language we were using wasn't inclusive enough um, and actually using people instead of citizens felt more all-encompassing and was better reflective of those communities. So I, I think working together will end up with a better outcome. We just need to listen. I think that aligning on language is really, really key and it's something we're really striving towards with the, the What Good Looks Like framework because we have What Good Looks Like for social care, we have What Good Looks Like for secondary care, we have What Good Looks Like for ICSs um, and we're looking at What Good Looks Like for primary care and one of our key drivers within that process is how do we create language when we talk about digital in the same way across all the sectors so it's just common so there's no longer the confusion etc about it and I think for me one of the things I picked up in conversations is how do we utilize digital to reduce the burden on the community sector because you know when we looked at it from a, a maturity assessment point of view there's lots of things that community sector even needs to do from like just a cyber security thing but you don't have the capabilities within those small organizations to actually deliver that or actually really sort of um sort of adhere to what is actually being asked of you so how do we so some of the conversations we had which were really interesting at an ics level was how do the organizations when they commission leverage their own services to support the community sector rather than expecting you to provide the the, the digital side to it actually how do you use our digital side to support you and take that burden off and let you focus on actually doing the service that you're commissioned to do tracy yeah thank you i think you know going back to the original question and, and thinking about the 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 potential of, of what we have in the sector in, in terms of digital. I think there's a couple of things for me. I think, yes, that absolute starting, just really those small steps to joining small data sets and coming together and having conversations around individual people. Yes, we do use people terminology. Um, but also, I, th I think, you know, there's, there's so much that the, the sector has to offer in terms of data. I just think about my organisation, Citizens Advice. I don't know if any of you have seen the cost of living briefings that we're doing online that everybody can come along to. The real-time data about what's happening in our communities at the moment, they give us insights into crisis support. And what they're telling us is, where do we need to put our resources? Where do we need to put our energy and effort? Now, the people who we are seeing today are your patients tomorrow. The people, your, your patients now are, are, are the people we're going to see on, on Friday. So, you know, it, it, it's absolutely essential that, that we start to, to have some really mature conversations about how do we amalgamate this data? Because we're never going to move away from having a focus on organizations and resources towards what we're trying to do, which is about people and communities, until we use our data to enable that. And, and I'm absolutely passionate about the fact that a lot of the barriers that we um, kind of talk about around data are perceived barriers. And there, there are lots of things that we can do in the way that Kirsty's described, you know, just make a start on some of this. So I think, you know, as we start to look at where we can make a difference across data, then I think that the, the voluntary sector has a, a, a massive amount to offer. I think there is some confusion, Will, around 
how do we as a sector really support those organisations that are small organisations who struggle with even the basics around collecting data and there's quite a lot of work that we're doing to look at that because I don't think that the obligation is just on the commissioning organisation or, 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 or on um, you know the, 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 the kind of the infrastructure that exists across health and care I think there's a real obligation across the voluntary sector for us to help mobilize the really good work that happens in communities so that it can work in conjunction with all the things that are, that, that are happening across health and care. Masood, you? Um, a lot to cover but I think part of this is priorities and we have a choice Either we do the right thing or we do things right. And when we get distracted by the details of what language we use, I think it takes up a lot of time and effort. I'm not saying it's not important, but is it the priority? And I think when we consider the priorities, for me anyway, we're moving towards a new world where collaboration is key. Therefore, we need the right culture therefore we need the right leadership and the right people so actually our focus should be on the people I say that because you know when we look at the DMA I was involved in the DMA last year it was very acute provider focused well most care happens in primary care so what are our leaders doing about that most of them not much I know when I had the opportunity to do something different, I did it. As a system, I think we were the first to actually appoint a system level primary care CCIO. I'm going to embarrass him because he's here in the audience, so Dr. Zishan Youssef is there. But it was a game changer because suddenly our primary care colleagues had someone at a system level who was a voice for them that was providing input to change things for the future where it mattered so again let's work out what the priorities are and focus on those um, and it is key because people will drive the culture which will then create the opportunity for sharing and collaboration I think the technology piece is easy you just have to walk around this hall there's so many different solutions that are available they will solve our problems the problem is we don't know how to structure our approach in order to actually take advantage of that, which is why we have a piecemeal approach to everything. The whole point of having an ICB and an ICS is a system level approach, system level thinking, an enterprise approach. But we can't do that unless we've got people that actually understand what that means. And I suspect if you go to most systems you'll find that people are still thinking with that old mindset of, but how will this affect my organization? What do I need to do? Rather than saying, actually, how do I help you? Because if I help you, it's gonna help me, either upstream or downstream. But we're not there yet. And I think we have to be really honest about rather than kind of the minutia, because in reality, we're always gonna be using different languages. It's just, we can't standardize. Why? Because language is about nuance and about context. And rather than try and fix it, embrace it. Actually, we should be making the effort to understand different people's perspectives. Why do they use people in certain contexts? Why do they use citizen? Why do they use patient? They're all appropriate, which means we can't give a catch-all definition and expect that it means the same thing. It doesn't. So why are we trying so hard to do that? Any other uh, questions? Oh, there's a lady there. Thank you very much to the panel. It's really amazing sort of to hear all the different touch points and, and how things interlink because, um, so I'm Kelly. Uh, I am part of a social enterprise that provides digital therapeutic interventions for children and people's mental health. Um, and we are nice recommended, our products are nice recommended. And on top of that, we combine therapy, gaming, and data. And we're, you know, met all the hurdles that you've talked about in terms of data maturity, MHSDS, DTAC, et cetera, and children's mental health. 
despite this, I guess one of the challenges that we've found is really around, you know, to what you're all talking about, that broader ICS dream of actually digital is really well suited to, to be um, elevated at that ICS level, but actually we're not seeing that happening still. And I don't know whether that is um, around funding and how it's funded. <laughs> I can see Masood smiling. But I really sort of appreciate your comments around um, culture, because culture eats strategy for breakfast, we know. Is there a way to align the two, I wonder? Um, and how do you see it's kind of the forward journey for digital therapeutics? Um, interventions to really aid, you know, prevention, early intervention, um, and and tackling, you know, a, a really common difficulty across the generation. Sorry, long winded on. Kirsty, do you want to answer it's that? It's really interesting the the points that you've made, and I think one of the things there is that historically digital funding has been separate from clinical or care funding. And for me, I think the biggest change in approach that we need to take is to stop thinking about digital separately. We need to think about digitally enabled clinical pathways or digitally enabled therapeutic pathways. So the digital's not the, the with a capital D, it's just part of the story. But that needs the, the clinicians, the therapists to be the drivers for the change. It just happens to be that it's tools and toys enabled. Um, rather than digital being the, the ones making the big business cases. And I think that lands much better at our boards in our senior communities because it's focused on the patients and the <coughs> benefits and the outcomes rather than focusing on the kit and the technology. Um, so we've got to work with our boards to change that language and change that approach and have the clinicians leading the business cases, not the digital teams. And I think if we can do that, we can uh, embed things in a completely different way. Masood? Um, focusing on outcomes. Sounds obvious. But how can you focus on outcomes when the financial structures we have are about getting return on investment within the year? Equally, how can we invest? Because that's the thing. It's about investment, not cost. But investment takes time to deliver the outcomes. Yet, every year, we go through this cycle of being given pots of money for capital investment without a guarantee of what happens next. That's not the way to operate any long-term plan. It just isn't. And yet we are put under pressure to do this year on year. An example, the HTAF funding. <laughs> for those of you that were involved, with very little notice, a pot of money is available. You have to decide how to spend it within weeks, even less than weeks. And then you have to have the results before the end of the financial year. Now, a cynic might say, that sounds like a political maneuver to score brownie points with the public before a potential election. That's what a cynic might say. Let's be honest, come on. If we really want to invest in our population, we have to invest. That means funding in the right way, funding in capacity to deliver. Most ICBs do not have well-funded digital teams. Yet the expectation is that you're gonna have a, a view of the system and you're gonna help with population health outcomes. Come on. It's not going to happen. It just isn't. We're not making things easy for ourselves. Well, no, that's not true. When I say we, someone isn't making things easy for us. <laughs> Your example yourself, you know, physiotherapy services, services that are embracing new ways of working, new approaches, gamifying, all of these things. We should be working out how do we support you in order to be adopted and scale. I suspect the reality is you're banging on our door to say, please, can you give me an opportunity to showcase what we can do? Things aren't working in the right way. They're just not. And I think money is a really important factor. 
Can I touch on that point, um, Masood? Because I think that, that is the elephant in the room, the money element. I know in terms of my system, and you touched on it, Kirsty, about less people, um, there is a mass massive financial deficit. I mean, they say it's down to all the strikes that have been happening. And, you know, we've got funding that happens sort of in year for digital. So how do we sort of move forward with integration and transformation in this financial climate? What, what, what can we do moving forward? We stop making excuses. I mean, look, it's, it's in a way, so many moons ago, I was in the BMA, I was the chair of negotiators for the junior doctors committee. That was the game that I was in. So I understand how it's played out in the politics. And currently there is a very convenient excuse to blame all the woes of the NHS on industrial action. Does it help? Of course it doesn't. But to suddenly say, ah, oh, listen, we were doing fine. We were tackling waiting lists. Everything was going to be peachy. But now because of these pesky junior doctors, you know, all our plans have gone out the window. That's not true. The truth is we haven't invested enough in the future care of our population. And until we do so, we're not going to fix things. Can we fix things? Absolutely. Do we have the solutions available? Absolutely. Again, just walk around this hall. There's so much good tech out there. But we need to be honest about where we are. We need to have, I believe we need to have visionary leaders that aren't worried about surviving, but are focused on how do we thrive. That's the reality. And until we actually be honest about where we are and where we want to be, we're going to keep going around in circles. Tracy, do you want to come in there? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> yeah, I, uh, when we talk about finances and resources, and I'm, I'm not going to shy away from this conversation, um, but I do want to talk a bit about um, how we, we look at our cultural shift as well. Um, I've been a charity CEO for the last 20 years and every single year I wonder when I do my budget how we are going to deliver the services going forward because I never know where the money's coming from. In our sector we get 12 months contracts if we're lucky. Sometimes we're asked to deliver things on a six month basis. That needs to change, there's no doubt about it. And also I think you know, who, who would run a social welfare advice charity in a cost of living crisis in the most deprived local authority area in the country, Blackpool? Um, so we're, we're, we're well versed in our sector in understanding the financial challenges. So I do say often to my colleagues in, in health and care, kind of welcome to my world. You know, I've been, I've been trying to navigate this massive need for what we do against limited resources for a long, long time. And my local authority colleagues say, yes, we've been doing that as well since our budgets were hit, uh, you know, 10 years ago or, or, or less than that. Um, I think, it, you know, the, there is an element of us recognising the problem. And Masu's absolutely right. I think it can be something that, that can be solved, but we've got to be really honest about what the challenges are here uh, and change the way in which we're doing these things. We cannot see money coming in for winter pressures in September and expecting the system to mobilise itself around how we deal with those. It's utter madness. And I think things are beginning to change in that. I really am hopeful. But just on the point about culture, absolutely, we, we, we have to change the culture, not least because that will change the way in which we think about how we resource things. And some of the mechanisms to do that are thinking about our values, our collective responsibility, our collective actions. And it's a small step, but what we're doing in Lancashire and South Cumbria is last July, the ICB and the VCFSE Alliance signed a partnership agreement that sets out how we're going to work together. And that's the framework, really, that's going to take us forward to change that culture. So now I'm saying it's not good enough to offer a 12-month contract to anybody in our sector. Three to five-year funding is absolutely the direction that we need to go in. And that's what that agreement says. Uh, we're coming to the last five minutes, so I'm just going to open up to more general questions. Has anyone got any uh, questions from the panel? If not, I'm going to... Uh, go to my panel and, and maybe ask them to perhaps give them their reflection of the, of, of, of the future. 
about where they sort of see things moving forward. Um, Masood, I'm going to start perhaps with you and then... Uh um, I think we can influence the future. But I think the first step is being very honest about where we are at the moment and not politicizing health and care. The second is investing in people, good people. You ask why people, you know, are based in Blackpool doing the things that they do. It's because your values driven. And we have so many people that are values driven. You're not in healthcare because of the money. You're in health and care because you want to make a difference. And we need to invest in the right people so that they can do the right thing. And thirdly, I think we need some accountability. And so governance is key. Because at the moment, with these deficits, which are in hundreds of millions of pounds, you tell me who's accountable. It's not clear because everyone has the opportunity to point the finger at someone else. And yet this is public's, this is taxpayers' money that's going to plug the gap. Tracy. Thank you. I think it's a really simple one for me that the, the future looks so much brighter if we can all stop thinking about organisations and resources and concentrate on people and communities. And I think one of the things that we probably haven't touched on today but is really kind of at the heart of that is we need to start listening to our communities and we need to really value that lived experience that people bring and I think that's when we will really start to transform the way in which we deliver health and care. I think it's really useful that you use the phrase transform. For me that's the thing, the key, that we know that if you carry on doing the same thing you get the same output and we're, we're trying to do the same thing cut little bits off, quips here, little tiny bits of money there. And the deficits that we've got are so significant. If we don't make transformational change, we will never make a difference. So we've got to throw things a little bit up in the air and think about things a little bit more radically. And in particular, the way we work together to tackle this huge problem, rather than in our isolated towers, because all of our towers are crumbling. Uh, we might just have enough to build one house together. So I think we're gonna have to do that. Finally, well, yeah. I think that collaboration is key, isn't it? I think how we come together as a whole system approach and all the talk we have from a maturity point of view, etc., is about how we come together as a system, how we look at that pathways across the whole system, not just within their borders of an ICS, but across ICS borders or within place layers, etc. And I think, I think sort of working out how we how we look at using digital to enable that. I think touching on it being an enabler for me, I'll love it when we don't talk about digital transformation, we just talk about transformation enabled by digital because that's what it should be. And getting it more in the hands of the clinicians who are leading these things, the chief operating officers, where we see real success is it's not digitally led, it's led by, like if we look at an EPR uh, implementation, for example, if you lead it with your chief operating officer, for example, not the digital side, it has a lot better outcome success because they're driving from an outcomes point of view, coming back to some of the other points. And I think that's key for me is how do we, how do we take away the digital being the leading of the things and just use it as the enabler to, to deliver on what we actually need to do. Fantastic. Brilliant discussion. We are a minute to go and I think we're going to draw it to close. So I just want to give a, a round of applause to our, our panel. Really great discussion. So. Uh, I want to say, um, yeah, thank you everyone for listening and some really great questions. I hope you enjoy the day. If you are staying in the group, there is a few minute gap before the next talk, but if you are leaving, please leave by the back. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs>